on Sky News Australia. This is the Rita Panahi Show. Good evening and welcome to the Rita Panahi Show. Coming up tonight, extraordinary curfews imposed in Alice Springs as pressure intensifies on Prime Minister Anthony Albanese to visit the violence plague region. Parents reportedly withdrawing their daughters from a girls football tournament in New South Wales due to the number of trans players. We'll speak to John Ruddick about that. And Queen Camilla gives an update on Princess Catherine. Darren Grimes will join me from London later in the hour. And as always, plenty of lefties losing it, including a masterclass from lefty slayer himself, Dr Jordan Peterson. ...than the purported increase in temperature that you're planning to measure. This isn't data. This is guess. And there's something weird underneath it. There's something weird that isn't oriented well towards human beings underneath it. It has this guise of compassion. Oh, we're going to save the poor in the future. It's like that's what the bloody communists said. Let's jump into today's big stories with Sky News contributor Prue McSween. And Prue, let's start with those scenes in Alex Alice Springs. We've had uh, just uh, terrible scenes of violence prompting a mm. curfew for minors. Under 18s will be forced off the streets at night to help put an end to the violence and riots we've seen in recent days. And this violence really has plagued Alice Springs for months now. And the Northern Territory Labor government is desperately, Prue, trying to stave off calls for a federal takeover. Well, Rita, it's demonstrated over the years that it's incapable of handling this, of, of fixing this. And so has the Albanese government. What did he do? He, he was forced, virtually embarrassed, into flying in to try and uh, fix it. And he lasted, what, three or four hours? Didn't even bother to go and meet mm, with, you know, the exactly. people involved. Threw some million dollars at it and hoped it would go away. You know, this is an entrenched problem and until people make some hard decisions and face the facts, throwing money at it is not going to help. What we really need to do is, in the short term, I think get the ADF up there because the police just haven't... Got, there aren't the numbers up there to be able to cope with it. But they have to look at the greater problem, and that is that there are children living in homes where it's dangerous. So they roam the streets. They're influenced by um, alcohol, whether it's be from their parents or themselves consuming it from an early age. There's violence. These kids need some sort of help and to me I think David Littleproud the Nationals came up with the idea of of developing youth camps where they could actually give these kids a purpose in life take them somewhere in the Northern Territory and I believe there are some youth camps there now there's a couple of them where they're given skills they're given a home to live in that's safe welfare health checks all the things that kids need that every child in Australia deserves to have and 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 yet we tiptoe around the sensitivities because of the stolen generation. So people don't want to confront what the reality of what's going up, the, uh, up, up, up in the Northern Territory. Well, yeah, what you just suggested is hugely controversial because it would be, uh, in the minds of many, another stolen generation, mm -hmm. um, even though the intentions here are to, to help these kids and not have them in this cycle of violence and unemployment. I spoke to Jacinta Nampajimpa Price last night, Prue, and she explained what's happening in Alice, Alice Springs as far as the, the nature of uh, retribution, payback, mm -hmm. sorry business, and that's a large part of it that I guess many people yeah. don't understand if you're, if you're not familiar with the culture like Jacinta Price is. Um, a young man lost his life in a car accident and others in the car uh, ran away allegedly and now there is payback happening in the community and, and that's part of some of the violence that we're seeing. Um, it, it really is such a terrible situation and you're right, the Prime Minister did go there the last time this became national news. He only stayed for a few hours and mm. then flew back to Melbourne to go watch the tennis. It's unbelievable, Rita, isn't it, when you think about it, because it's such a political hot potato. And I feel that, you know, they're, they're really doing the wrong things. It's blind justice that they're talking about. 
we wouldn't do this to a white kid. A white Australian kid would not be left in harm's way. And, and, and sadly, we're just turning our backs on this, these Indigenous young people who deserve the life that every other child in Australia has. It's really tragic. Now, we had uh, NT councillor Gavin Morris on Sky earlier today, and he had this to say. If there's a, a bigger crisis that's going on in Alice Springs at the moment that needs to occur to trigger an intervention from outside of Alice Springs to support the amazing Northern Territory Police to do their work, then this is it. That absolutely abhorrent attack on that young Uindamu U- girl, 100 metres from the police station um, a few nights ago, in addition to the two deaths where young people are stealing cars in payback and trying to run each other over, uh, that escalation requires an intervention which is, comes from the strongest possible terms. I am calling for, for, the, uh, for, for that type of support because without it, this conversation does not change. And all we see now is a tit-for-tat retribution response where we're using Aboriginal traditional law, uh, corrupting it so we can justify gangland violence on our streets. Prue, the Chief Minister, Eva Lawler, is sending 58 more officers to help police the town. But I do wonder, can someone who thinks colonialism has something to do with youth crime in 2024 really be expected to stamp it out? She has previously said this. She said, overall, it would be the perfect world if we'd not have a detention facility in the Northern Territory. Let's not forget the history of Australia was built on us being colonised by a detention facility from England. So we have had young people, we've had people in trouble with the law for the whole of Australia's uh, history, history of Australia. I mean, really, how is that even relevant? Why even mention that in any context when you're dealing with this particular crisis right here, right now? Well, the woman, you know, obviously has been putting those thoughts ahead of the welfare of the children and the crisis that she's, you know, supposed to be managing. She was dragged kicking and screaming to the, you know, the media yesterday and, you know, making this grand announcement about the curfew. So what? What happens in 14 days when the curfew's over? Does she think that things are going to be all good again? Uh, These are all Band-Aid temporary measures. She's not willing to address the issue. And any woke thoughts that she may have is, again, contributing to the issue. She should be moved out of the position. I, you know, you'd normally say bring the feds in to take over, but the feds are just as inept. inept. So, you know, we're going to have this ongoing problem until someone like a John Howard did with the intervention come in and try and help solve the problem, but no one's brave enough to do it. Let's move along to the front page of the Herald Sun today. Again, it's the AFL drug saga, the latest AFL drug saga. We're finding out around 100 current AFL players have secret immunity from the league's three-strike drugs policy. Players who confessed to having taken drugs in the days before AFL games were allegedly given off-the-books secret drug tests to ensure their systems were clear or were advised to fake an injury to avoid a match day test, which, if positive, could see them suspended for an extended period of time. Prue, this is something I've been writing about for years, I think well over a decade. The AFL may remain defiant and say they've done nothing wrong, but their illicit drug code isn't about exposing drug use or even stopping drug use. It it, it is a brand management exercise to hide illicit drug use. It was always going to end in tears and uh, I think we're there now. We certainly are. You know, the arrogance and sense of entitlement of the AFL is astounding. To think that an employer would snub their nose at OH&S regulations you know, it's just beyond belief. They say they're committed to the well-being and welfare of their players. Well, that's absolute baloney. They're treating their players as a commodity, just useful, disposable livestock, clearly, uh, just for the good of their game, their egos. It's just astounding. And, I, you know, I think that 
thank goodness there's been this whistleblower doctor and let's just hope that mm -hmm. someone comes in and makes sure that they you know this kind of behavior is not condoned and not practice anymore you know it's it's a scandal now, uh, bad news for Qantas shareholders. Uh, their brand value has dropped some $384 million in the past 12 months. The brand finance report has ranked Qantas the 21st uh, airline in the world for brand value, down five places from the previous year. I mean, this is all part of Alan Joyce's legacy, isn't it, Prue? Damaging this once pristine brand. It was almost universally loved once, once upon a time. And now, well, there's been a fair bit of criticism. Certainly is. And he's laughing all the way to the bank. And, you know, Qantas is suffering a $384 million uh, discount in its worth. I mean, the spirit of Australia has really become the dispirit of Australia. People are totally, uh, you know, walking away from them. You know, there's been a betrayal. It's like a, a betraying partner where you, you really feel like <laughs> you've been done over, that you cannot trust them anymore. Mm. They're going to have to really lift their game. They've got this new CEO. Hopefully she's going to be able to, to save the brand. Their biggest plus is that there are a lot of people wedded to them because of their loyalty program. And so they yes. probably will you know, continue, but I, I just feel that it's such a shame to see that one, a once very brilliant airline has suffered the consequences of very bad management. Well, they still charge like a premium airline, but I would argue <laughs> they're no longer a premium airline, uh, certainly not domestically. The, the service levels, uh, even the snack they give you on board, it, it is no way near what it used to be, the mm. attitude of a lot of the flight attendants. And worse than all that, Prue, I've got to say, because I do fly them regularly, the incessant politics, uh, The as soon as you land anywhere in the country, having some racial politics shoved down your throat, uninvited. I mean, why are they persisting with that? We had a referendum. I think the country made its feelings clear despite Qantas's activism, and yet they're not stepping back from this activism. And they're not the only corporate that's ignoring it, or the only mm. state government when we look at all the treaties that are persisting, you know. So it just seems like, as we know, corporates don't care, they have agendas, uh, and government doesn't care either. They will when the ballot box uh, results come out, but, you know, Qantas and all these other organisations, I'm sick of being welcomed to my own country. There are, an occasion, are occasions when it's OK, but let's face it, we're all over it and it's time to move on. And Qantas needs to start having its antenna up and understanding what its customers are expecting of it. And that's service, uh, regular on-time flights and uh, cost-effective, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not being uh, milked like we seem to be currently with uh, the prices of flights. Yes, and I guess Virgin isn't much better either because they, they've been uh, guilty of some of the same offences as Qantas. Uh, Prue yeah. McSween, thank you so much for your time this evening. Now, New South Wales Libertarian Party MLC, John Ruddick, has been a voice of reason against the Labor government's conversion practices ban bill. Trans conversion therapy is too often the new gay conversion therapy. Research conducted on thousands of gender-confused kids in the 1980s by Canadian psychologist Dr Kenneth Zucker revealed that if left alone under the watchful waiting approach, 89% of gender-confused kids turned out to be normal, healthy, happy, gay adults. And that going through puberty is in many cases the solution to gender confusion. John Ruddick joins me now. John, you argue these new laws will see medical interventions performed on gender-confused kids and you call it transing away the gay. Are you arguing that these uh, anti-conversion bills, as they are called, are actually anti-gay? Well, inadvertently, yes. Now, I, I'm not saying that it's never a, 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 a something that could be required, but I do believe uh, in overwhelming number of cases what's happening is that there's 
teenagers who are feeling confused about various things. And they, you know, they, they are probably on, uh, probably going to end up being a, a, a happy, normal, uh, healthy, adult, uh, gay person. Uh, but I'm going to tell you what's been happening here, Rita. The, the, the Labor government, with the assistance of the Greens, just absolutely shoved this thing through the parliament last week. They did not want an inquiry. Mm -hmm. They did not want media attention. And they just got... And we sat till 7 o'clock in the morning to get this through. Now... I have had more people in my office on this issue than any other issue by a mile. Now, a lot of the people that come to see me <clears throat> are conservative Christian groups, very nice people. Now then, the, a very large number of other than, uh, people seeing me saying exactly the same thing as the conservative Christian groups are old school feminists, LGB drop the T mm -hmm. groups, OK? And these two groups, which yep. have never had anything in common in the past, conservative Christians, <laughs> you, know, you know, people who were out there, you know, you know uh, uh, campaigning for, for gay, gay, gay rights reforms, etc. over the last few decades, they are both in complete agreement here. Now, one of the things that the LGB Drop the T group people said to me was, I've, in fact, I've heard this about three times from them, in my office, they said, John, thank God I didn't grow up as a gay teenager today because they would have transed me. Mm. They would have seen that, you know, I might have been a bit of a tomboy, I might have been an effeminate male, and they would have trans me. Now, now, I think that is happening. I'm not saying it's happening in every case, but I am saying I think it's probably happening in a majority of cases. So this is why we need caution on this subject. Yeah, and we, we've, we've got caution around the world. Uh, it's astonishing that New South Wales does this in the same week when you had the NHS in the UK ban puberty blockers for under 18s and we're pretending none of that is happening and just uh, going right ahead with this gender affirming model and, and these uh, they, they always give these bills great sounding names you could never disagree with anti-conversion bill of course we're all against conversion therapy but when you look at the detail, there's a lot more in there. Now, the world's uh, self-proclaimed biggest LGBTQIA plus women's and non-binary football club, the Flying Bats in Sydney, well, they've won every game they've played in the pre-season Beryl Ackroyd Cup tournament. Now, I can't be sure, but this may have something to do with it. They have up to five biological males in their female team. Some of them are around 30 years of age. Uh, they're playing against uh, women who are as young as 15. And the Flying Bats are, not surprisingly, winning games with huge margins, with one trans player scoring six goals in a 10-0 victory. John, it's been reported that parents are withdrawing their daughters from this uh, girls' football tournament due to safety concerns. Well, look, the Flying Bats was started in the 1980s as an explicitly lesbian female soccer team, OK? And that took courage in the 1980s to do that, and good on them for that. What has happened over the last decade or so is that this, this club has attracted trans players, OK, into the club. And now that the, the, the club is almost half trans players. So they have this pre-season cup. Uh, the Flying Bats won every game. As you said, one of them, they won at 10-0 and they won the final last weekend 4-0. Now, I put up on uh, Twitter earlier today, Rita, uh, four audios, uh, three audios. Somebody sent me a, a, the audio recording of a meeting that took place about 10 days ago. Now, this meeting was called because the other clubs that have got no chance of winning uh, had, had got, gotten together informally and they had discussed, what can we do? Some of these girls are getting badly mm -hmm. injured. They can't win the grand final, so sort of what's the point? So they got together informally about two weeks ago and they, one of the options that they discussed was to boycott games against the, uh, the Flying Bats. Now, when the Football New South Wales people heard about that, they called a meeting last Wednesday and somebody happened to give me a recording of that meeting. And I put up the highlights earlier today. Now, one of those uh, meetings was uh, somebody, somebody who's, who's a well-known uh, club president, he said, he said, look, he gave the example of, of, a, of a young girl who, who had a, you know, a, a, a nasty tackle with one of these players and broken the leg twice and can't play football again. He said... At this, at this meeting, which a lot of people were there, it sounded like, that he's lost 24 female soccer players from his club. They just don't want to play. So something's going wrong here. Mm -hmm. Now, you know that the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Act, under Section 38P, 
It explicitly why says they, that sporting bodies... Why are they playing at all, John? Are... Why aren't these teams well, look. pulling out, saying we are not going to show up to get beaten by players who have got a biolog biological advantage, undeniable, and we're not going to participate in this. I mean, if you don't have an opposing team, you're not going to have a competition. Well, the administrators last week at this thing on this audio that I put up, they were asked that question and they basically they give a reply saying, oh, well, look, it'll be anti-discrimination if we say that these players can't play. Mm. That is not true. Section 38P of the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Act explicitly says to sporting associations, if you do exclude someone over a transgender issue, it is not discrimination in the eyes of the law. That's what the law is at the moment. And, you know, it might be changed later this year, mm. but that's the law. So it's the sporting associations are doing it themselves. Now, if, if, if that is the view of the sporting association, I think it's only of the officials, the bureaucrats, OK? I think how they can resolve this issue, Rita, is this. Have a democratic vote of all the players and a private vote, a secret vote. And we just we, we let the players say, look, do we want to let these trans people play? And, and, and if a majority says that they don't, well, then they should be excluded. Now, there might be some female sport, soccer associations that say, yeah, no, we're fine with them. OK, so let's, let's work it out there. Well, I don't agree, but, John. Uh, I, I think I, it's a I matter of fitness. I think it's a matter of fairness. And I don't think it should be down to a vote where people could be pressured or, you know, the teams who might have a few trans players vote yes because they know they're going to win more games. It's just a matter of biology. It's a matter of... We've got... There's a reason why we have men and women's competition and this shouldn't be something that is controversial to say male bodies should be playing in male competitions. Let's not forget we had the Matildas not that long ago, the women's national soccer team, uh, play an under-15 boys team from Newcastle, New South Wales, Newcastle, not the UK... They lost 7-0 to the under-15 boys from Newcastle. I mean, the, the differences between men and women are there and to pretend they're not only disadvantages women. Before you go, I want to ask you about Argentina and Javier Millet. He's uh, kicking goal after goal as a president there. Sovereign bonds are hitting record highs ahead of the Easter weekend. And uh, he's taken a chainsaw to public spending, John, uh, and really ramped up a, a, a raft of pro-investor measures. Uh, what can we learn from, from here? The local economists there are saying the markets are celebrating. Uh, he's only been there a short time. I know I don't want to prematurely uh, celebrate the results, but it's all heading in the right direction. Inflation is down, investment is up. Well, Reti, you asked, what can we learn from Harvey Malay? And I've got a one-word answer. Everything. We can learn everything from Harvey Blake. Now, we have uh, right-of-centre parties, and we have right-of-centre parties in the English-speaking world. They talk tough in opposition. You know, Joe Hockey and Tony Abbott talked tough about budget repair. Boris Johnson was, you know, was much better in opposition. Now they come to power, and they're so weak. Now, Harvey Blake is not a politician. He's a, he's a lifelong economic, uh, economist and academic. Now, he has come to power with 56% of the vote and he is not mucking around, Rita. He is getting on with the job. He's a man on a mission. Now, Harvey Malay and his supporters like myself did warn before he was elected. We said, if he wins, things are going to get worse for two years because that's what happened with Reagan and Thatcher when they brought in much more mild reforms, very good reforms, but nothing as good as Malay, and the British economy under Thatcher and the uh, uh, American economy under Reagan both had, both had a bad two years and they were very unpopular in their early part. Now, they said, look, we've got a sick economy, we need to give it some tough love, some tough medicine, and it's going to not feel great at first, but then we will rebound with strength. And that is precisely what happened in the United States and the UK in the 1980s. Now, what's happening with Malay, to our surprise, is with all this, these blockbuster reforms and just not mucking around, what it's done is it's told the international community, the investors, they say, look, Argentina is a hot property. And so, to my very pleasant surprise, Rita, it is. things We've are run improving out of time, much quicker John, than I we'll... expected they would. Absolutely. And I'm sure we'll be talking about Javier Millet for uh, many months and perhaps years to come. John Raddick, thank you so much for your time this evening. And don't go anywhere. I've got a snake hunter on set next and he's brought in a deadly snake. I don't know why, because that deadly snake almost killed him recently. And of course, lefties losing it.
Welcome back. And it's time for Lefties Losing It. Let's start with a masterclass in lefty annihilation delivered by the master himself, Dr. Jordan Peterson. Watch him school this lefty, Stephen Bonnell. I've never heard of him. He's called Destiny, apparently. Uh, I don't know. After this, he might change his name to Depressi. Because, like, I could imagine somebody saying that, like, they don't trust, like, a large government. They think there's too much, uh, you know, prone to tyranny or something like that, but also be supportive of an institution like the Catholic Church, which is literally, you know, one guy who is a direct right, line to God. Right, but they can't tax. Um, well, I mean, there's... And they don't have a military. That and is... And they can't conscript you. True, right? yeah. And they can't throw you in jail. That is true, yeah. <laughs> it was a wide-ranging debate about uh, religion, big government, big pharma, and climate change. Here... Destiny argues that we've just had the hottest year on record. We just got another one of the hottest years on record. How many times are we going to have another hottest year on record? How many times are we going to have an increase of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere before we're finally like, okay. I don't hmm. know. And the, the reason I don't know is because it depends. The scientific answer to that question depends precisely on the time frame over which you evaluate the climate fluctuation. And that's actually an intractable scientific problem. So you might say, well, if you take the last 100 years, this variation looks pretty dismal. And I'd say, well, what if, what if you took the last 150,000 years? And I've saved the best for last. Here, Dr Peterson explains what the climate catastrophists do, their communist-like compassion narrative, which is anything but. Sit back and enjoy. I think it's pretty undeniable at this point that there is an impact on climate across the planet I, just I think that's highly deniable. We have no idea what the impact is from. We don't know where the carbon dioxide is from. We can't measure the warming of the oceans. We have terrible temperature records going back 100 years. Almost all the terrestrial temperature uh, 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 detection sites were first put outside urban areas, and then as and then right, and then you have to warm. correct. Then you have to correct for the for the movement of the urban areas, and then you introduce an error parameter that's larger than the purported increase in temperature that you're planning to measure. This isn't data. This is guess. And there's something weird underneath it. There's something weird that isn't oriented well towards human beings underneath it. It has this guise of compassion. Oh, we're going to save the poor in the future. It's like that's what the bloody communists said. And they killed a lot of people doing it. And we're walking down that same road now with this insistence that, you know, we're so compassionate that we care about the poor a hundred years from now. And if we have to wipe out several hundred million of them now, well, that's a small price to pay for the future utopia. And we've heard that sort of thing before. And the alternative to that is for is to stop having global level elites plot out a utopian future or even an anti-dystopian future. And that's exactly what's happening now with organizations like the WEF. And if this wasn't immediately impacting the poor in a devastating manner, I wouldn't care about it that much, but it is. You know, I watched over the course of the last five years, the estimates of the number of people who were in serious danger of food privation rise from about 100 million to about 350 million. That's a major price to pay for a little bit of what, what would you say for for progress on the climate front that's so narrow it can't even be measured. I don't think the increase in, in hungry people on the in the planet is because of climate policies. Why not? Think, because, because I don't think that countries in Africa are being pushed away from fossil fuels. I mean, most developing countries. Of course nations, they are. Right? They, can't even get, they can't even get loans from the World Bank to produce, for, per, pursue fossil fuel development. And there's plenty of African leaders who are screeching at the top of their lungs about that because the elites in the West have decided that, well, it was okay for us to use fossil fuel for, so that we wouldn't have to starve to death and our children had some opportunities, but maybe the starving masses that are too large a load for the world anyways shouldn't have that opportunity. And that's, that's direct policy from the UN fostered by organizations like the w, WEF. They're going to have to turn to renewables. Yeah, well, good luck with that. Isn't he magnificent? Now, from the sublime to the ridiculous, let's hear from Democrat Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal. This is gaslighting on a mass scale, telling girls and women that banning male bodies from sporting competitions, female sporting competitions, hurts all women. My amendment would require a report on the impacts of this bill on all female athletes since categorical bans on trans women harm all women. That is why women's organizations across the country, including the Women's Sports Foundation, 
have denounced categorical bans on trans athletes for promoting fear, dangerous stereotypes, unfair scrutiny on high-performing female athletes, and sex di discrimination based on misinformation. And just think about this for a second. How are you going to enforce this ban? How do you verify a girl or a woman's, quote, reproductive anatomy? I don't know, Pramila. Maybe uh, you can consult this kid. Boys have a penis, girls have a vagina. <laughs> <laughs> now, my next guest is known as the Snake Hunter. He previously appeared on our show to warn of the dangers of Australian snakes that could be lurking in your backyard. But Mark Pelly nearly became a victim himself of a tiger snake. Yes, we almost lost Mark after he got a love bite from the, one of the world's most uh, venomous snakes. But he has made a miraculous recovery and he joins me now with a highly venomous tiger snake. You brought in the snake that almost killed you. Why? Why? I want people to see how dangerous they can be, but also they only bite you when they're picked up or harassed in some way. So if you leave snakes alone, they'll leave you alone too. Well, you can't leave them alone because mm -hmm. your job is to go and pick them up and, and take them out of people's property. What happened? Because you would have handled probably hundreds, thousands of dangerous snakes in, in your years. How did this one get you? It was a routine call out like every other day and multiple times a day. This time, however, I had an equipment failure and the snake was quite large, very big, very fast, and it got me on my hand just here, and it really, really hurt at the time. Wow. And you, you would think if you got bitten on the hand, you know what the snake is, uh, you would recover very quickly. You get some anti-venom, but you almost died. How, how does that happen? So most of the time, almost all the time when a snake bites you, the venom travels through your lymphatic system. Yeah. I was one of the very rare cases where the snake actually bit me on a vein on my finger oh, and the venom travelled straight to my circulatory system. So it went to my brain and my organs very, very quickly. And your daughter was there and she said she thought you were gone. Um, and there was a bit of confusion with the anti-venom because I'm looking at this tiger snake and I would swear that's a brown snake, but it's a tiger and I think they were trying to give you brown snake anti-venom. Uh, so how does that work? If you are bitten by a snake, how important is it to know what snake you've been bitten by? It's actually not important to know what snake you've been bitten by, but in my case, I knew exactly what it was being a snake catcher. My daughter also seeing the snake and she's a snake catcher as well. So if you're bitten by a snake, don't try to capture it and try and bring it into hospital or try to identify it because they can do a venom swab test or they can just give you both anti-venoms. Okay. In my case, however, I was bitten by a tiger snake and because the venom went straight to my blood, um, I was feeling the effects very fast. When, they, when I didn't respond to the first vial of antivenom for the tiger snake bite, they tried to give me brown snake antivenom, oh, okay. and that's what happened. Okay, so you had to convince them, no, give yes. me more tiger snake. Now, you've had this close call. You've come through it, thank God, good and well. Uh, so hopefully now we've got a more sensible profession, no? <laughs> I'm still going to go straight back to snake catching the moment <laughs> I can. Why? Is this, why? Well, I believe snakes play a very important role um, in the environment and someone's got to do it. If I don't go around catching snakes, then people will try to kill them. And when I was in hospital and I thought I was actually going to die from the snake bite, my final message where I couldn't even open my eyes to the community was to still keep um, away from snakes and leave them alone and get a professional snake catcher to come out. I was afraid that my, you know, bitten bit by a snake would cause people to try and go after them themselves. Now, your daughter <laughs> um, documented your recovery, but... She noted that you were copying a fair bit of hate online. Why? You're never criticised by those doing more than you in life. <laughs> and True. I also have the saying, and Dave Chappelle said it best, when a, when a hero stumbles, cowards rejoice. And the very few people who had something nasty to say, it's a reflection of themselves rather than me. But no so are they angry with you because you're out there <clears throat> and interfering with wildlife or is it because they think... Um, what, what, yeah, what, what is the source of their hostility? I, I think they didn't show any kind of 
inclination to say they didn't like my job, rather they just not liked me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so no matter what you do in life, you're going to get haters. Well, yeah, that's not a bad, that, yeah, that, that is true. Now, if you're bitten by a snake, if you're out, I don't know, bushwalking and, and you're not close to a hospital or medical attention and it is something like a tiger snake or a eastern brown, something deadly, what do you do? What is the thing to do to maximise uh, your chances of survival? Absolutely. The first step you take is you step away from the snake. Don't try to touch it. Don't try to handle it. Move away because it can no, bite no, you more you've than once. Already, oh, so you, you don't want to get bitten more than once? Absolutely. It can bite you a second time. I didn't even think of that. Yeah. <laughs> once you're safely away from the snake, immediately call triple zero. You need medical help as soon as possible. Yeah, but what if you're somewhere remote? So should you walk towards safety or is walking actually something that's going to be counterproductive because it's going to the blood's going to course through your veins quicker so if you have no help around you it's better to walk to a position where you can get call for help mm -hmm. um, rather than lay there and let, let the snake venom take you out so get to a position where you can get help as soon as possible once there stay as still as you can and apply a pressure bandage and follow the instructions of triple zero it's critical okay so uh, get phone for help but if you can't phone, then walk to somewhere where you can. If you're by yourself. If you're by yourself. But snakes, like you said, are typically scared of people. So if, if how, how many are we losing on a typical year in Australia to, to deadly snakes? Actually, not many for a very good reason. The message of leaving snakes alone is getting out there. And second, Australia is a world leader in anti-venom mm. and the treatment of snake bites. So we don't lose many people. Unfortunately, we recently lost someone in Queensland who got yeah. bitten by a brown. But for the most part, people tend to survive snake bites, provided they don't get bitten on a vein. Yeah, well, like like you. That's. Uh, do you know as soon as you're bitten, whether it's in the vein, is, is the impact so immediate that... Uh, you know it's got you right in the bloodstream? When it bit me, I saw the blood coming out of the bite marks oh. and I saw where it got me on a vein. I actually saw the vein, um, so I knew myself. And the pain going through my hands was something I can't describe. It was like my bones were on fire. Oh, okay. So if you get... If, you, if it gets you in the vein, you'll know about it. Oh, goodness me. Mark Pelly, uh, I tried to encourage you to find more sensible employment, but I have failed. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you for having me. Still to come, Queen Camilla gives a rare update on Princess Catherine. Darren Grimes joins me next. Welcome back. Queen Camilla gave a rare public update on Kate Middleton's well-being during a visit to a farmer's market. She said the princess would be thrilled by all the kind well wishes and support. Hello. Oh, I shall send this off to Catherine. I will be thrilled. That's it. Can I send yes, this off? That's really kind. Joining me now is GB News host and founder of Reasoned UK, Darren Grimes. Uh, Darren, Queen Camilla is uh, becoming a favourite as she supports King Charles and Kate during their respective cancer battles. Absolutely, she definitely has. She's been a guiding light of that family. Even Prince William has had his struggles with her in the past. He, I don't think that's a, a, a secret as far as the royal court is concerned. But actually, they're closer than ever before. You know, Camilla has been working her socks off whilst the King and, of course, uh, the Princess of Wales are out of action. And uh, you know, a good friend of mine told me an anecdote of when he was on a British Airways flight when Camilla, but back then was still Camilla Shand. And he said that she was the most down to earth, a fun individual that he'd ever encountered on a flight, in a random flight like that. And I think she is just a very, very nice, genuine person. But she's been there at a time when I think the nation is feeling a really quite profound sense of, of sorrow towards uh, Prince Princess of Wales and, and King Charles. 
and the king in his Easter message, he stressed the an importance of acts of friendship, especially in a time of need, talking about, you know, the, the Easter message being one of uh, hard times and uh, finding light, renewal, hope in times of darkness. And I think actually that goes for the nation as well, not just the royal family. I really feel that, you know, amidst all the well, the darkness, actually a ray of light being brought about. And, and Kate's message, Rita, I think was really an important one that's given a lot of people a lot of hope and encouragement. Well, there was so much conjecture about uh, Catherine's well-being, obviously, uh, before she made her statement. And uh, there's been a few apologies since then, including from some very high-profile yeah. celebrities. But... Let's have a look at uh, TV host Stephen Colbert's commentary about Kate before she announced her diagnosis and the apology or non-apology after. The kingdom has been all flutter by the seeming disappearance of Kate Middleton. Well, now internet sleuths are guessing that Kate's absence may be related to her husband and the future King of England, William, having an affair. We did some jokes about that mystery and all the attendant you know, frou-fra in the reporting about that. And when I made those jokes, uh, that upset some people. And even before her diagnosis was revealed. And I can understand that. I mean, a lot of my jokes have upset people in the past. And I'm sure some of my jokes will upset people in the future. It was kind of a tortured apology, not apology, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, this is just another liberal lout as far as I'm concerned. You know, what a disgusting thing to say. It wasn't a joke. I actually think he, he you know, in reporting that, thought that he was giving some really cool, insightful gossip. But to accuse Prince William of having an affair at a time when actually he had the burden of having his both his wife and his father battling cancer, of course, simultaneously. Imagine the burden of that. It must almost be unbearable, but he, you know, he continues to carry out his duties with the same kind of quiet dignity and, and the resolve that actually we've come to expect from him. And thank God he's the heir, Rita, and not the spare, because Prince Harry is anything but quiet, you know, ginge and the whinge over there. But he puts on a brave face in public, even as his personal life is... is in utter turmoil. So I actually think for Mr. Colbert and others, the royal family have just said to hell with them. They've come together. There is a real show of unity and strength. And I think, as we said earlier, Queen Camilla is a pillar of support for both Charles and Catherine. And I think that's a reminder that even in the face of pretty unimaginable adversity, I wouldn't be able to imagine my Itself in that scenario, having two loved ones going through the same disease. But actually, they're a beacon of, of resilience and fortitude. And that wasn't always the prediction, Rita, with this slimmed down monarchy that King Charles always wanted. Mm. But I think they're pulling through all right. I think they're emerging pretty strong and united. And that's even after Prince Harry and uh, Meghan Markle have done all they can to ensure that wasn't the case. Now, British comedian Ed Gamble is launching his comedy tour, A Hot Diggity Dog, that's what it's called, but he couldn't advertise that on London's Underground because Mayor Sadiq Khan has issued a junk food ban, so he had to switch out that hot dog for a, uh, I think he's got a cucumber in the ad that's actually approved. Yep. <laughs> I mean, really, is this uh, considered dangerous on the tube to see an image of a hot dog? Yeah, exactly, Rita. I mean, you, you put it perfectly. <laughs> Basically, what's going on in London at the moment, you can have your, your phone taken from some hooligan on one of those scooters. You can have a, a, a knife put against you. You can have all sorts of things in, in Sadiq Khan's Lawless London. But what you can't have, Rita, is an advert featuring a hot dog because you cannot be trusted seeing a picture of a hot dog. I don't know what he thinks is going to happen, Rita. Does he think that we're going to just go away by the 
nearest can of brine hot dogs and shove them down our gullets. It's just, it's it's patronising <laughs> guff. And it's the kind of sort of state control that a socialist like Sadiq Khan absolutely loves, Rita. It's madness. Oh, it is, but you've got London's real problems, and they've got a few being uh, largely ignored. Uh, uh, you shared a video of commuters having to watch a stabbing on a train. It's deeply disturbing. We can't play it, but this is a major story in the UK today. Uh, it's horrific footage, but it's, it's not isolated. The rise of knife crime in London in recent years is horrific. 21% jump last year, close to 14,000 incidents recorded in the capital in the 12 months to June 2023. Uh, just tell me about that issue, crime in London, and what's being done about it? It's terrible, Rita. I mean, Sadiq Khan is the ultimate race baiter, right? And he actually has argued in the past that the Tories' policy of stop and search is discriminatory and racist and all the rest of it. His acolytes all say the same thing. And actually it's not, you know, statistically speaking, black men are more likely to carry out these kinds of crimes. And it's black mothers in London who are saying, please continue stop and search because actually I would love for my child to be able to live. And it's as profound as that. Uh, Sadiq Khan, today, after that, you describe it well. It's a horrific incident with a, a knife. It's one of these zombie blades. And Sadiq Khan has said mm. in the past, he's quite clear that as far as he's concerned, London is a safe city. Now, I don't know about you, having seen that footage, Rita, but I don't think that's my idea of a safe city. Where I think we're going to end up in a position where we need uh, searches and detectors in underground stations. And, you know, given that story that we just mentioned there, a man stabbed in broad daylight on a train in London, Victoria, with passengers, you can see them that are visibly shaken. You can hear it's audible, but they'll be pleased to know, Rita, mm. I'm sure, that Mayor Khan has protected them from hot dogs when they do eventually arrive petrified at Victoria Station. And you just ask yourself, Rita, how come the police as well didn't immediately release the ID of the suspect? Because it's pretty easy to get a good idea from that clip of what the ethnicity, for one, of the suspect is. But once again, I fear it's accusations of racism that are preventing robust and efficient mm. policing. And this is, as you've covered before, this is exactly what allowed the systemic rape of children to go on via primarily Pakistani man, men here in parts of this country. And it just depresses me to the core. I think the public now, Rita, in London especially, are just utterly desensitised to seeing such scenes as these. You know, to you, they look shocking, they look new, they look otherworldly, something from Hollywood. But actually today, in our capital, they're all too common. And uh, it's, it's... Well, a 21% it's grim. Something has to change. In, in, well, and a 21% jump in a single year in knife crime in London, that is something to be concerned about. Darren Grimes, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thanks, Rita. That's it from me tonight. Up next is Newsnight. I'll see you Sunday morning for Outsiders. Good night. Good <laughs> night.